Hey everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47 and another episode of Gearbox 2.0. In this episode, I'm going to be giving you a primer on how to set up the Fujifilm X-T3 for video shooting. So let's get started. All right, boys and girls, this is the first episode of Gearbox for 2019. First of all, Happy New Year to everybody that is watching. I hope that this year is your best year yet. I am super excited about what's going to be happening with the C47 in this coming year, not only for productions that I'll be doing, post projects that I'll be doing, but also for content that I will be creating for this channel and in general under the educational part of the C47. So let's talk about the X-T3, my pick for camera of the year for 2018. It's not that I don't love what's happening in digital cinema cameras, but for me, this was sort of a big leap forward, not only for Fuji, but also in this space. Why? Well, you can argue, and I don't think I would um, retaliate, that's a bad word for it, but uh, argue back that what companies like Sony have been doing in full frame in this form factor have been pretty phenomenal, and I'm expecting great things in 2019 from them as well. Um, historically, when I made the jump from one-third to two-third inch camera systems to larger sensor, the jump was really a big one. So I was using a lot of cameras like the DVX100, HVX200, other smaller chip cameras, and using 35 millimeter lens adapters so we could get that same field of view, selective focus that we would be getting out of large sensors. And then when the 5D Mark II came out, that was sort of the game changer for me, and especially when they added 24. So, while I'm really excited about what companies like Panasonic are doing with the GH series, especially now the GH5 and GH5S, um, I gravitate to super 35 millimeter and full frame sensors. So this Fujifilm X-T3, uh, basically super 35 millimeter sensor, and ticks off a lot of the boxes that I've been waiting for. Uh, really good autofocus. It has high data rates that you can record to. We're getting into internal 10-bit recording. And so what I wanted to do is just create a little video for you guys on some of the things that I think you should be thinking about when setting up this camera for video shooting. Um, it's kind of early days for me with this camera, but I've shot enough stuff with it that I think I can take you through some things that will help you get set up as well, or just if you're interested in what the camera system is all about. So let's do that. Uh, first and foremost, things you need to think about when you're shooting with mirrorless cameras and DSLRs of this form factor and using them in video. Uh, number one, batteries. So you want to make sure that you have enough of these suckers right here. I would say you're going to want to have probably four to five of these for a day of shooting. Uh, the new batteries are the 126S's that come with this camera. They have a slightly higher capacity from the previous ones. You may look at some other powering solutions for this camera as well if you want to run that for longer periods of time. Uh, second thing is this camera system does not have a flip, traditional flip up, flip out screen, right? So you can do this, which is great for some of your video shooting. You can do this, which is kind of interesting uh, when you're shooting, you know, uh, portrait mode for stills. And again, one of the things that for me is really exciting about this camera is this is my hybrid camera. This is for stills and for video. Uh, but you can't flip it out for selfie mode. You can't flip it up. So you're going to probably want to get some sort of third party monitoring solution. Um, I am partial to the small HD focus because of this um, you know, ability to be able to flip it, auto orientation. If you're going to use an external uh, monitor recorder today, my recommendation would be the Ninja 5 from Atomos uh, because you're going to be able to take that HDMI out and you're going to be able to do a 10-bit 422 with it. So definitely an external monitor of some sort, I think, if you're shooting video. 
And then from a lensing standpoint, you're really gonna wanna think about having lenses that are well suited for video shooting. Now I have on here the kit lens, which is the 18 to 55. It's actually one of the best kit lenses on the market. It is an F 2.8 to an F 4 through the range. It gets pretty close to F 4 pretty early on. So you have to just consider that. But one of the big things about this lens is it does have optical image stabilization. And not all of Fujifilm's lenses do. Also over here, I have the 10 to 24. That's also an OIS or optical image stabilized lens. So great for video. They have a few more in their lineup that are OIS. And those would be the ones that I'd be thinking about if you're not on sticks or using a gimbal or something like that. And of course, if you really want to make the jump, they are phenomenal. You have the two MK lenses in X mount now as well, the 18 to 55 and the 50 to 135. Really, really great lenses. And don't forget your ND filters. Now this is a very ND right here that I have for the 18 to 55. If you're gonna buy one ND filter and it's gonna be a fixed ND, generally I have found that a 1.2, which is four stops, is a good number to start with when you're shooting outside in daylight. Now if you're gonna be using a lens adapter with your X-T3 and you're gonna be using that in completely manual mode, there's no contacts and things like that, for instance, using these Olympus Zuko OM lenses, then what you're gonna to wanna to do is go into the menu system on your camera, go under the setup menu, you're gonna choose button dial setting, you're gonna go and scroll down to where it says shoot without lens and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that is turned on. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about using this camera more operationally when you wanna shoot video with it. So this is kind of the real primer part of it. So hopefully you can see that screen there on B camera and I'm gonna first do a couple of things. The first one is I'm gonna change this dial here, it's called the drive dial, to the movie icon so that I can now shoot video with it. I'm also gonna change my shutter speed dial to a 60th of a second. Most of the time I'm shooting in either 30 or in 24. So that way I can do that. And then I'm just gonna make an adjustment here and you can see that I can in fact set this to a 48th of a second for my shutter speed, which is great. So let's jump into the movie setting menu and there are a number of pages inside of here. I'm not gonna cover every single one of these, but I am gonna dig into a couple of them a little bit more in detail. So the first three options that we're gonna be talking about here are movie mode, the container that we're using to basically hold all of that stuff and the type of compression that's being used. Um, these two are actually tied into each other very, very closely. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily name each of these menu items what they're named, but we're gonna go over each of these and I think they'll make sense. So under movie mode, we're basically choosing three options here. We're choosing our resolution, which can also define our aspect ratio. We're choosing our frame rate, and then we are also choosing our data rate. So depending on what your combinations are having to do with your movie compression options and your movie mode and things like that, they can all affect especially things like your frame rate and your data rate settings. So right now we have this set up to record in H.265, which is a more efficient type of compression and we are setting this also to record in long gop, so a group of pictures. Now in theory, long gop is more processor intensive when you get into post-production. All intra is individual frames of video that are being captured, and because we're capturing long gop or all intra at similar data rates, in file size, terms, it's not necessarily a huge difference. In theory, all interest should be easier for your NLE to process, but um, interestingly enough, at least for Final Cut Pro 10, I have found that the long gop setting has been giving me better results in terms of playback in the timeline if I don't transcode. So let's just leave it on long gop to begin with here. We go back to movie mode. And you can see here, these are my frame rates that are available to me in UHD 4K, 3840 by 2160. 
and also my data rates. So I have 100, 200, and 400. Now what's really great about this is with a camera system like the a7 III from Sony, when you're shooting in full HD 1920 by 1080, you are recording at 50 megabits per second generally. Um, math would say that if you then change that camera system to UHD 4K, four times the amount of pixels, or total pixels, that you should be able to shoot at at least 200 megabits per second to retain the same quality with the same type of compression. But you can't. It only lets you record up to 100 megabits per second. Not true with the X-T3. We can go to 200 and even 400 megabits per second. Now if I go back to movie compression here and I choose all intra and I go back up to movie mode, you will see that it does in fact with those individual frames of video being captured for all of those frames, limit you in terms of those higher frame rates, and it also fixes you, interestingly enough, to the 400 megabits per second data rate in terms of making sure that you're capturing the best quality that you can. I've been finding that with my test that Longop has been yielding great results overall, and for sort of everyday shooting, I'm shooting at 200 megabits per second. And then if I want to make sure that I am getting the most out of that recording, I'm changing it to 400 megabits per second. Now this other menu here, H.265 versus H.264. The obvious choice here is H.265. It may not be supported by every NLE, but it is going to give you that ability to record to this internal SD card if they are fast enough, V60 at least or higher, at 10-bit 420. So you're getting all of that additional color that you're capturing there. We do not have that option with H.264 internally. We can only do 8-bit 420. Externally, through the HDMI port, it's actually going to be 10-bit 422 with either of those two choices when you are using the camera system. Okay, so there are some full HD high-speed recording options. Those are conforming in camera. So if you wanted to shoot at 120, your playback would be at 2398 with this option selected. So I've turned that off because we're going to be using UHD 4K for at least the stuff that I'm shooting right now. Film simulation, we have this Eterna film simulation. We also have other options like their standard Provia, their Velvia. Astia, Classic Chrome, and then we have some other options in here, some of the monochrome options. But I'm going to leave that on Eterna as sort of my everyday setting. I've been finding that I really like the look of that. Dynamic range, we can choose 100%, 200%, or 400%. As you can imagine, as you change this setting, it's going to eke out a little bit more in terms of especially your highlight roll-off. So if you're outside, you'll probably want to set that to a higher setting. But that's not all, boys and girls. We go down to the second page here, and you'll see that there are a lot of additional options, which all tie in together with each other, having to do with highlight tone priority, shadow tone, color, sharpness, noise reduction. These are all tunable by you when you're using the camera system. There is an interframe noise reduction option here generally not something you would use for high frame rates. I have not done any tests with this as of yet to see how well it works. Generally, I'm a let's turn the sharpening down and not mess with too much in-camera noise reduction and do that in post type of person. So let's go ahead and talk about F-Log recording with this camera system. What's interesting about this is that the approach that Fujifilm is taking is very similar to Airy and Panasonic's approach. When you go into their log recording modes, you are basically choosing not only to get the most dynamic range out of your camera system and its sensor, you are also going into a wide gamut option. That's very different from a company like Canon, which allows you to sort of mix and match. You can choose your gamma, and then you can choose your gamut. Gamma has to do with dynamic range, how your blacks to whites are captured in your camera system. Gamut, of course, has to do with color. So in this particular camera system, when you are choosing F-Log, what is happening is you're getting that flat, low contrast image to get the most dynamic range out of your sensor, but you're also going into a Rec 2020 gamut. 
Now, because we have those higher data rates and we can record at 400 megabits per second and all intra, this combination makes a lot of sense. And if you are pushing this F log out of the camera system, you're doing so at 10 bit 422. So you can really see that those combinations in such a small camera system is gonna give you a lot of options overall. And the last thing to talk about when it comes to F-Log are the LUTs that you can download from Fujifilm. There are three of them and they all do very different things. The first LUT when you're taking and applying it to your F-Log recording is essentially taking your stuff and putting it into a wide dynamic range and a Rec. 709 color gamut. So you're still gonna get a little bit of roll off on those highlights when you're doing the conversion, but that's sort of like your day in, day out LUT that you would use. The LUTs themselves, of course, could be loaded onto something like this focus monitor or onto a Ninja 5 from Atomos, so you can actually use those LUTs. The other two LUTs are a little bit different. One of them is actually leaving everything in F-Log when it comes to the gamma settings, but then putting it into that Rec. 709 gamut or that triangle. That means that you're gonna make your own exposure adjustments, but that your color space is already in 709. And then the last one is a little bit confusing to me because it does a conversion to a Turna, which is that look that they have inside, that really film look that they have inside of the camera as an option, but also Rec. 709. And my guess is what it's actually doing is it's listing Eterna as really more of a color matrix. It's sort of that look that is being applied and it's putting everything into Rec. 709. So it's not really defining, at least from the name of the LUT, what the gamma is. Um, from what I can tell, it is not leaving it as F-log in terms of the gamma. It's doing an overall conversion to 709, but with that Eterna look and feel. Now the thing that you should know about F-Log on this camera system is that there is no built-in LUT that you can apply when you have it activated. So you are going to have to rely upon an external monitor of some sort if you want to see a LUT applied to F-Log for your recordings. So now we move to the next page and this is really where we're talking about our autofocus options. It's very extensive in this camera. I have found that I am extremely happy with how good the AF system is here. I have found that I'm very happy with the AF options in here. For movie AF mode, I generally keep that on area. And then when I'm using the joystick on the back of the monitor, I can actually go ahead and just move it around. As you can see here, I actually have this set up to touch AF. So I can also just touch in different places in the screen because this is a touch screen for this particular camera system. So a couple of other things here, when you're using the AF system on your camera, there is a little switch on the front left-hand side of the camera, or front right if you're looking at the front of the camera, and you can switch that between M for manual, which puts it into full manual mode, you can set it to C for continuous, for continuous autofocus, or S for single. If you are using continuous autofocus with the camera, this AFC custom setting menu is fantastic. It lets you set your tracking sensitivity to lock onto objects and how well they're locking onto them. Additionally, for me, the big one, AF speed. So if you wanna do slow racks, you would set this to a minus value in here. I have it set to minus five, and I've actually been very happy with that setting. Face detection, again, works extremely well on this camera system, and you'll see that there are a lot of options there. And then there are options here for manual focus assist, so if you did have that dial set to M, you could actually have focus peaking activated there, and you can choose your color and whether or not you're seeing a lot of that or a little for your low to high options. So again, really nice features overall. And then we also have some options here in the fourth menu here, which I think are important to take a look at. Number one, HDMI record control. So if you're using an external recorder, let's say something like the Atomos Ninja 5, you'll want to make sure that that is on. We have zebras inside of here. Unfortunately, at least at the time being, these zebras don't go below 50, though that is lower than in some camera systems. 
The reason I'd want to see lower than 50 is if I'm using a gray card and I'm shooting an F log, I want to be able to see that in a lower setting here. And then you can go into your timecode settings. And importantly, we have HDMI timecode output so that if you are using an external recorder that you can turn that on. And then in terms of timecode here, rec run or free run, I generally will do a free run with a time of day. So you can go ahead and choose that and then you can manually input that time of day or you can choose the clock that is on your camera system. Whew, okay. So I think that that's the general primer for using the X-T3 for video. There is so much more I have to learn about this camera system, but hopefully if you've watched this whole video, it's given you some insight into some of the things that you're seeing inside of those menu systems and why you would or would not choose those for different types of shooting scenarios. As always, subscribe to the channel, tap that bell so you get notifications when new content is posted to the C47 YouTube channel, and I'll see you guys next time on Gearbox.